My name is Magdi Saba. I'm a consultant cardiac electrophysiologist at St. George's Hospital in London, and I specialize in cardiac arrhythmias. So the criteria that define high risk in ventricular tachyarrhythmias are uh, multiple. But if we come to think about ventricular tachycardia uh, and its main cause, it's probably ischemic heart disease and SCAR. So SCAR-related ventricular tachycardia is probably the most serious thing we're looking for. Um, so I would suggest uh, when we see a patient with ventricular tachycardia, the first thing we want to know is what their ejection fraction looks like. If they have a history of coronary disease, myocardial infarction. So an echocardiogram that would show us some areas of hypokinesia or akinesia uh, or even an ECG that shows you where the Q waves are. Uh, prior history of ischemic heart disease is very telling. And that's a typical high-risk patient with ventricular tachycardia. Um, and other causes of ventricular tachycardia, such as cardiomyopathies, non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, such as, for example, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which affects mainly the right ventricle, but could also involve the left ventricle, are high-risk features. Um, the way to diagnose is it's a little bit more tricky. There's ECG criteria, major and minor criteria on cardiac imaging. So a cardiac MRI in that instance would probably be helpful. And it, depending on the type of ventricular tachycardia we see, we can look at the ECG and say whether it's left ventricular, right ventricular, and the age of the patient and their history, we can typically define the patient who needs further imaging. There are less um, risky forms of ventricular tachycardia, uh, ventricular tachycardia that involves normal hearts or ostensibly normal hearts on echo, um, typically from the outflow tracts. So the right ventricular outflow tract, um, occasionally from the papillary muscles, um, and these are labeled as normal heart VTs. Of course, there's something abnormal about them, but normal in terms of structure and no evidence of scar or infiltrative disease. So the R on T phenomenon is something that we see very occasionally. It's a premature ventricular complex that happens on the T wave, some, somewhere in the um, uh, vulnerable window around the peak of the T wave, just before the peak or just after the peak. And it can lead to a fast ventricular arrhythmia, typically ventricular fibrillation, not monomorphic VT. It's usually related to triggered activity, not automaticity, um, and it can frequently occur with uh, drug-related um, uh, issues. Um, we don't see it, um, it clinically that often. We, it's not something that we tend to worry about uh, in terms of the coupling interval of the ectopic beat. They typically occur after the T wave, but when we see it happen or if we see brief runs of non-sustained VT after the, that phenomenon, we tend to worry about them a little bit more. But fortunately, it's not that common. And the way to risk stratify these patients would be with a treadmill test, for example, also an echocardiogram to see if there's anything we can predict. If, if on, a, on an exercise treadmill test, for example, there's more ectopy, uh, triggered activity and more uh, ir disorganized ventricular arrhythmia, then they would, these would be high-risk features. But again, this is not something we see often. The methods we have at our disposal to treat ventricular arrhythmias are, are multiple. Fortunately, we're in a technologically advanced state compared to 20 years ago. So uh, let's take a patient with ventricular tachycardia, a uh, middle-aged person uh, who's had a prior history of a myocardial infarction, for example, the typical uh, scenario. We get an echocardiogram. We confirm, let's say, there's a fear anterior wall scar. We confirm this with an MRI to really define the topography of the scar, how deep it is, transmural. Uh, the patient will ultimately get a defibrillator because that's um, indicated for secondary prevention. So that's the, probably the mainstay, is to have the backup of a defibrillator, an ICD implantable cardioverter defibrillator to protect them from sudden death. That's number one. Beta blocker therapy is probably the mainstay of medical therapy.
that would be the initial form of treatment because it raises the threshold for ventricular fibrillation. It also raises the threshold for uh, monomorphic fast VT. So it's you're, the best thing you can do, is, especially in an ischemic heart disease patient. Uh, treating their coronary disease, making sure that the uh, coronary circulation is as open as it can be and uh, that there are no obstructing lesions. That's very important. And then coming on to the arrhythmia itself, we have several options. There's antiarrhythmic drug therapy and there's ablation therapy. We typically will start with antiarrhythmic drug therapy, and in cases with ischemic heart disease or high-risk VT, we tend to stay away from class 1 drugs, such as flecainide, enconide, quinidine, and we favor class 3 drugs, such as sotalol, amiodarone. Those are probably the go-to drugs we use, typically amiodarone, occasionally dronetarone. Um, and when the patient fails these drugs, gets breakthrough VT, then we offer them an ablation procedure. We have moved further into the ablation, uh, we've moved ablation further upstream in treating patients with VT uh, in preference to drug therapy in certain cases, where a relatively young patient who we think maybe amiodarone would be too much for them for many, many years, we offer them primary ablation. So after they get their ICD, a few months later, we bring them back for elective VT ablation. And the way we do this is typically under general anesthesia. We create a 3D electronatomic map of the ventricle, uh, endocardially, and occasionally epicardially, depending on the substrate we think, based on MRI imaging and the nature of the disease. And we uh, create a scar map, and we can identify the exit of the ventricular tachycardia circuit once it's induced from typically the scar border. And that can be very successful. The success rate is clearly, it's, it's easily in the 90% range acutely, but unfortunately we have a recurrence rate that can range anywhere from 25 to 60%, depending on the study you look at. More recently, with substrate modification, which is not just targeting the VT exit site from the scar and doing a single point ablation, but we target all the possible channels within the scar and homogenizing the scar, if you will, we can get success rates that are over 90% acutely and in the mid 80s, 84, 85% in the intermediate term looking at one year. So there is very good data now to support the use of VT ablation upstream before the patient gets multiple ICD shocks, before drugs fail. Looking at the effect of VT ablation on mortality. While there's no direct evidence from randomized controlled trials in VT ablation uh, looking at mortality, uh, there's a very large series recently published uh, from UCLA involving 12 centers worldwide and their VT, their cumulative VT ablation experience over uh, 1,200 patients. And it, it confirms to us that patients who undergo VT ablation and remain free of VT afterwards, in the years afterwards, two-year follow-up minimum, have lower mortality than those who have VT recurrence. Now, this is observational. Uh, there could obviously be issues with bias. Those who are selected for VT ablation may have been healthier, but we know that VT recurrence after an ablation is associated with higher mortality, and those who get no recurrence or less recurrence have higher survival rates. So these are very promising results in that the efforts put into VT ablation over the past 25 years seem to be bearing fruit in that we can potentially be saving lives and not just reducing ICD shocks.